Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. Maura Shapiro here, Senior Gallery Director with Park West Gallery, and I'm just delighted to have with me today one of the world's greatest contemporary sculptors and artists in general, the amazing Mr. Nano Lopez. Nano, so nice to see you, my friend. How are you? Really looking forward to How spending time together so we can really go deep into your work and, and talk about you know what makes you tick as an artist. I thought a good place to start would be your childhood, because I know you grew up in Colombia. And tell us about your family, your parents. Were your parents interested in art? How did they nurture your interest in art? And, and just tell us a little bit about your, you know, your early years. Yeah, I always uh, start talking about my uh, grandmother as being the first influence uh, really? because she she did she was an artist herself as a hobby artist, but she loved art and she collected uh, the masters and so we have a lot of the European masters in her house and sculptures and. Uh, she did sculpting herself, some, some wood carvings, ceramics. So she was into art. Um, and she was the director of the uh, a Museum of Art in Bogota. Wow. She was a contributor to the woman thing. So, so she was quite in the social, wow. involved in social stuff. What an in inspiring person for you as a child to be around. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, now, did so, you have a large family? Uh, no, not particularly. We're four. Four, four uh, children? Uh huh. And uh, what did your parents do? My father was a chemical engineer, uh -huh. so, and uh, the part of my father was interesting that I always mention is not so much the art part, but the adventure part. So we did a uh -huh. long trips. We did a fifteen-day trip in the uh, Amazonas forest in the river uh -huh. down with a you know when I was like twelve years old down the river for fifteen days in the, mm -hmm. for, in the jungle. So that was a real cool experience, you know, mm. uh, sleeping every night. And we did several excursions like that. And I always think that, I don't know, I, I just guess. It gave me a, uh, a deep sense of uh, something about nature. Nature, you know? absolutely. A cool experience as a kid, I think. Yeah, I would imagine. Very yeah. inf very impactful as a, as a kid, especially at 12, 13 years old. Yeah. And spending quality time with your father and your, and your family. So you were always interested in art as a youngster? You're always drawing and you know pursuing interest in art? Yeah, I think obviously in the in kindergarten I enter uh, the school. I mean, I didn't. I was five years old. But the school had a inter-school, inter-municipal school contest for drawing, and I won the first prize, and that's the photo I have <laughs> in the book, and of a clown, and uh, so the photo with the director of the school in the newspaper, the cultural newspaper page of, you know, like the main <laughs> paper in Bogota. You know? <laughs> and that was cool, so that's clearly a, obviously an interest there, although all kids are artists, so. You know, there's no difference there. Right, but not all kids have their their oh, drawing yeah. in the in the newspaper. Yeah, <laughs> That's so the newspaper. I, yeah, so I think during the next several years, ten years or something, I don't particularly feel I was uh, nothing particular stand up as interested in art, except the environment. Mm -hmm. But um, but the first uh, strong connections to art or the strong. Uh, love when it, the, the love for art started it, it started and it, and it was passionate and that's probably around 15 16. yeah, yeah. now you finish your reg regular education regular school education and then did you go to art school after that yeah in Bogota I, I went to uh, um, to a couple of uh, academies a small academies for sculpting you know go and take a certain months mm -hmm. courses I went to the National University just for also night courses so different different academies and things like that. But I also did a uh, study with a, a very famous uh, Colombian artist, contemporary artist, avant-garde. I think he's still alive, David Mansur. What is his name? David Mansur. David Mansur. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, he was an uh, avant-garde art, basically, mm -hmm. but also a very strong discipline, particularly in uh, drawing. In drawing, let me tell me that, yeah. And that's what I show that, uh, yeah. because I, up to this day, I consider the most important. Right, uh, yeah, the fundamental, influence. yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember you telling me you would have to do exercises of just drawing lines, like right. thousands of lines over and over and over again, light to dark, thin to thick, just get that real proficiency yeah, of line scale, quality. Yeah, the scale, control uh -huh. of the scale in, yeah. the, in the pencil, uh -huh. and the and durability, yeah, because uh, all the lines have to start in one point, finish at that point, although you don't have nothing that marks that. So right. visually, you yeah, have visually to recognize it, yeah. Yeah, go up, be ahead of your pencil, basically. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and yeah, master the, the 
the control of the pencil. Mm -hmm. And that is, is not only talk about control for the sake of control, I think, but but it, it, it to me it gives life to a line. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, you can find a line that is dead uh, or a line that is alive and fast. <laughs> and, and that's, uh, yes. to me, it's just all Inter in that control of the line. Interesting distinction. Yaakov Agam always says the greatest invention of human history was the line. <laughs> when you think about it, mm. everything springs from the line, right? Yeah. But uh, I've seen your drawings, and uh, you're a brilliant draftsman. I mean, incredible draftsman. I think all great sculptors have to be good drafts people. I mean, uh -huh. you can't really, uh, figurative sculpture in a way. Uh, you, you have to be able to draw before you can, you, and, and you draw in three dimensions, right? You know, create and almost three fun, dimensions. Yeah. So you finish your education, and then uh, what happens? I know you went to Spain for a while and studied with a, uh, a sculptor. Right, I studied in Colombia for, for that two years after high school, more or less. And then uh, my uh, cousin, which was studying classic guitar in Spain, in mm. Alicante, Spain, mm -hmm. uh, did uh, mention it to met a sculptor in, in Alicante, I guess, uh, and told him about me. So we communicated, you know, sent photos, took a month to get the photo. I mean, there's yeah. no internet, right? So <laughs> send photos to Europe, but take a year, I mean, a, a month <laughs> to get there, a month to get back. <laughs> so he liked the work and, and, uh, and said, yeah, tell him to come, I'll give him a job. And wow. Was, that's it. So a chance meeting from from uh, your cousin who played guitar, yes, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, so I end up in Madrid to, uh, one day to show up there to work for uh, for Francisco Baron, which I know is famous. Uh, Francisco Aron. Baron. 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 Francis, Francisco yeah, Baron. Yeah, he sculptures yes. all over Spain. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. So he did uh, with him, I worked for him two years and it was uh, really a great experience for me, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. working on granite pieces, marble pieces, fabrication, stainless steel. As well as casting. As casting. casting. Uh -huh. yeah. So you got some of your first, yeah, first, uh, you know, first ca bronze. casting experience there, yeah. And I know a lot of large pieces, monumental pieces too. So you got a real sense of scale in those works yeah. too. Yeah. And I remember you telling me that you almost lost your eye, your eyesight doing something there. Tell well, me that story. it wasn't that bad, but the first day I show up with the a studio for, of Francisco Aron Paco, uh, I mean, he was working on welding uh, in a big piece, in a monumental piece in a stainless steel with stick welding. And he just showed me very quickly and put the helm on here and scratch and he, well, yeah. oh, okay, cool. Just keep going. And he left for the afternoon. <laughs> so I kept going all, all, all afternoon. And obviously well, he wasn't all that specific in how fast you had to put your helm down. Oh, oh so you, and you scratch and do the helm down, but oh. you really had to do it quick. Yeah. Uh -huh. So... At night, when I wake up at two o'clock in the morning, I was completely blind. Oh my God. My eyes would hurt like crazy. It's like you have sand in the eyes. Oh boy. I wouldn't see anything. So, really, at first, I didn't know what it was. I guess soon I related it to the welding. Yeah. But yeah, it was a couple of scary hours. <laughs> <laughs> but the next day, you are. Okay. Next day, it was better. Mm -hmm. Thank God. I remember you telling me that story. That was crazy. So, now, how do you get to the United States? What, what uh, uh, transpired to get you to the U.S.? Well, so after Europe, I was in well, I was in Spain, worked for this guy for two years. Then I went to France, to Paris, studying mm -hmm. the Beaux Arts School. Oh, that's right, school, yeah. fine art school in Paris, yeah, Beaux Arts, yeah, not very easy. prestigious school. Right. Um, and did you study sculpture there, or yeah, all, sculpture. all fine art? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah that's not easy to enter there. You know, it's like a lot of people apply every right. year, and it's free. And uh, yeah. but actually, I got. The highest marks there in the first ten that uh, not surprised were accepted to the to the school. It was fun the, the the way they do it. As I remember, when you are trying to qualify for to enter the school, you have to go there one day and and draw one afternoon with with a model. Mm -hmm. So drawings, keep the drawings. Go the next day if you're going for a sculpture and do a sculpture, a little relief in this case, and they give you a, a subject matter. So you do the relief in clay and leave it there and come one week later and you will present what you did plus a sculpture you might have bring from home mm -hmm. and, and be in front of a table with a, a five, six professors mm. of Very school. Very intimidating. And, yeah. yeah, and they're in front of them. And uh -huh. I didn't speak French. I have a friend trying to translate, <laughs> but... Uh, I know the guys translated and they saw the drawings and the sculpture and, and one of the guys on the table said, oh, you could teach here, you know, say. You say, you, so you go, what? You could teach here. Oh, you, you could know. teach here. <laughs> but the sculpture was nice. I remember yeah. the day I loved the plate and uh -huh. it was very cool. 
So, so how many yeah. years there? In no, I just, I just was there for a year. A year in Bozart. Uh -huh. yeah. Bozart and again, you, yeah. half day there and half day working for Colombian tourist office to right. uh, for yeah. money. Uh -huh. yeah. That was good. But that was a very nice experience, of course, yeah. as a young kid in Paris. You know. I bet, I bet. Yeah. And cool. so then you came to the U.S. Then, I went, that? then yeah. I went to Colombia. Oh, back to Colombia. Uh -huh. Yeah, and then I built a, a studio in a, in a water tank. My mother had a house that had a, a big water tank and... Uh, I just put a roof on walls, finished it, and became my studio. And interesting thing with that is that I did very similarly thing in the United States years later. Right. In a building that burned down, and all was left was kind of like a water tank on the ground. Oh, really? And uh -huh. I went up and Built around finished it. it a lot bigger. But wow. Yeah. So yeah, I came to the United States. Uh, well, I went to Colombia for a couple of years of working, uh, using my stuff, and mm -hmm. uh, then came to the United States and work for a Spanish sculptor in Portland, Oregon. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's not that easy. I mean, at first I just worked picking up berries outside Portland yeah, for yeah, just jobs. a couple of weeks. And then then uh, somebody helped me find a job for um, with, a, with a Spanish sculptor, with a Manuel Izquierdo, well-known sculptor in Portland, mm -hmm. uh, which was great. I didn't speak much English. Uh, and this guy was uh, Spanish. I was just been living in Spain a right, long ago. So. Right. And he did fabrication and bronze casting. So I worked for him for about a year. And then uh, then I got a job in an art foundry outside Portland. Mm -hmm. and, uh, was that the Guilherys? No, the, the Mike Maiden yeah. foundry. They casted Guilherys. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, Mike Maiden. And he had half of the foundry in Walla Walla. So... Because of that, they sent me to help with uh, monuments. You know, mm -hmm. to, they saw my work and tried me doing monuments. And uh, um, so I went to Port to Guanajuato to do a couple of monuments for them there, and find out that it was a much more interesting to me foundry in Guanajuato, mm -hmm. more contemporary art than the founder I work in Portland was mostly uh, wildlife, you know, mm -hmm. bears and right. eagles and all of this. Yeah. And that was not my thing particularly. Right. So when I found out about this foundry that my, my intention in general was to go to LA or San Francisco or New York, you know, mm -hmm. but then I, this foundry was, as I say, more contemporary and they did work mostly for New York and LA artists. Mm -hmm. So I asked for a job, they gave me a job and, uh, that's why I moved to Walla Walla mm -hmm. to work for this foundry, which today is probably one of the best foundries internationally, none, mm -hmm. the best, more advanced foundries in the United really? States. Uh -huh. And you still it's, use it for your bronze? No, no, they're yeah. too expensive. Oh, too expensive, okay. <laughs> yeah. they are way, but you cut your teeth there, you got your training there. Huh? Yeah, I worked for them yeah. for a year, and then yeah. I started doing my own business, right. and doing enlargements for other artists. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. So you began by doing enlargements for other artists. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was clever. That's what I was doing for these foundries, and I started to be a, I started to get a little bit of reputation, and I started to be a lot of call. The foundries, the even foundry would call me at the same time that the founder I was working for was moving to a bigger building. So mm -hmm. the owner offered me that I would not want a foundry. Say, hey, why don't you just rent this building that we're living? And start a business, you know, mm -hmm. and that and say, so, yeah, sounds cool. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, so I started doing monuments for our artists, yeah. Right. Uh, now what year was this? That's probably eighty seven. Eighty seven. Okay. Uh -huh. yeah. okay. Yeah, so I did start doing uh, monuments and uh, did you know that area was like five six Art foundries, uh, counting Portland, Oregon, and right. the surrounding cities, kind of weird, but more foundries than almost anywhere else in the yeah, United States. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Except for some areas, not even in uh, Colorado or uh, San Francisco area, but not even that. It was uh -huh. a lot of foundries for weird, weird yeah. reasons. Yeah. But because of that, I also have a lot of demand for the enlargements. And uh, so I, then I, in 2000, I built a bigger building to do, be able to do big monuments mm -hmm. and uh, and continue to do that for yeah. years. And uh, at the same time, same I was time doing my work. Your own work. Yeah. And then it, it, little by little, your work started catching on and catching on and catching on. And now you're, you know, Getting now it's hard to keep galleries. up with the, with the demand. <laughs> you have that wonderful, envious position yeah. of being an artist who's so successful, mm -hmm. you know, that it's, it's challenging for you to keep up. So let's talk about the evolution of your own imagery. Um, and between the animals, which are so charming and whimsical in many cases and clever, and then your figurative pieces, 
pieces, which are serious, they're powerful, evocative, serious works. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how those images emerged, about the two different directions in which you work mm -hmm. today? Well, definitely first was my love was for anatomy, the classics, Michelangelo yes. was. My, I see that in your work, of course. Yeah, yeah Michelangelo. Michelangelo, my yeah. Absolute favorite uh, over anybody else, you know. Yeah. Maybe with, with marble too, you know. Yeah, and, yeah I love yeah. And that's what I did uh, in the first, when I was 16, 18, a lot of carving on stone. Mm -hmm. We have our stones around both. Uh, but yeah, uh, anatomy was my first love, of course. and. When I went to Spain, I started. I was working with the human figure, and I started to search for my own expression, from your own um, style. You, let's say, you know, you're searching. So, if you look at my work, you start to see the pieces with a, the direction, searching for for a style, searching for, yeah, your own personal uh, style. Yeah. Your and, vocabulary. Uh, yeah, and, yeah, and so the, soon enough, uh, you start feeling the pieces uh, as uh, I start to bring nature into into the human body. Mm -hmm. So I start to mix the human body with uh, uh, organic elements, with rock, and mm -hmm. then uh, bark, and uh, and particularly that I start to get stronger. Although the, for a while before it was very clearly putting the nature into the figure was was a period there that was very um, very soulful, very uh, strong, I think, powerful to me. Mm -hmm. The same way, very difficult to sell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, my, my favorite pieces come from that time. And that's mm -hmm. very, um, uh, how do you call that? The fears are very, um, um, hmm, it's a word that is not coming to my mind, but very broken, really. Uh, very uh, slightly towards the abstract, although they are very figurative, mm -hmm. but um, very torn. And uh, in my search, I always felt that I'm looking for a universal sense of humanness, you know. And uh, so, what I find interesting about that is, it was it's always been a mystery, I guess, what I'm trying to say, except to to find uh, essence of humanness. Mm -hmm. And uh, without getting um, distracted with any culture or country or race or gender, almost yeah. you know, Universality. Uh -huh. yeah, universality. Yeah, it's a, it's a yeah. search. I, often I used to. It recently was actually um, writing, no, reading something I wrote when I was twenty-four or so. Pretty interesting. I should show it to you later because it's well. It talks about a personality of. of, of a facet of the person of the human that remains in the shadows, and that, and uh, and I was working already. In, 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 I remember the words of the torn human beings, and a skeleton. Uh, people can see whatever they want. Uh, transparent skeletons, and translate it roughly. But uh, and I say in that writing, I say, but it's not that negative image. What what is. Um, uh, wanted to to bring, but the the void that that creates in your soul might bring an opposite response. So to me, it's all that very interesting. Uh, not that I understand it perfectly, but <laughs> uh, but it's, it's it's interesting the search for something very abstract and uh, very. I, I also remember when somebody maybe asked me when you know a piece is done, and I say it's almost like working, digging your hands into the earth and. And just feeling until until you you feel what you were looking for, but you don't even see it. Right. It's more a feeling than right. a, than a visual right. thing. You see uh -huh. the piece is finished. Why? I don't know. It just feels yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And you it's uh, still an abstract feeling. Do you have the experience when you look at your sculptures sometimes that you want would do, want to do more with them, or do you feel like everything is where you where you want it to be? No, and I have touched back in older pieces and, mm -hmm. and transforming, you know, some of these being an example. We do variations, different right. interpretations yeah, of our images, because, which is a good way to do that. Yeah, and yeah, I just, in the human form, I, it's not, I rarely wanted to do much actions because in a way I think the actions distracts from the human. It's like, I, as I said, I don't want nothing to be recognized as a, that's an action. It's, I'm talking about humanness. Right. So right. it's uh, yeah. So that's why the, maybe the standing figure like this attracts me because it's it's uh, it's very neutral. And Still it's, uh, very inward. Right. Uh, 
And on the other hand, your animals have a lot of uh, energy to them. Well, so the story, yeah, that is yeah. Uh, interesting with the animals. So obviously, I did the human figure for for many many years first, and after the um, the introduction of the, as I was talking earlier about the uh, the organic elements in the human form, starting to blend the organic with the human. Then little by little in the pieces, you start to see the gears start to be next to the pieces. So mm -hmm. I start to combine human with gears and in some compositions with letters and numbers, but they were not part of the pieces. They were separated. It's a piece. And the strangers that shows that is a whole uh, environment piece that so humans with a subway fabrication of steel and glass representing the subways or bus stations mm -hmm. or BC city thing seems. And, uh, that was attracting me. And uh, as I always said too, everything is very intuitive, really, not so much in, uh, in, you know, rational, conceptual, but rather intuitive. It attracts me. Mm -hmm. It goes in. It, it gets, yeah. Mm -hmm. So gears start to appear next to the pieces and the numbers and letters attract me a lot. And as I often say, you know, when I, at first when people tell me what the numbers and letters mean, I say, well, nothing, you know, just <laughs> numbers and letters. <laughs> but when I think deeper about it, uh, it really means civilization. It really means human history. It's right, uh, right. literature, yeah. mathematics, yeah. all of it. Rational mind, human yeah, mind. So it brings mm -hmm. us into and that to continue maybe with the with the human figure, then I did all of that and at all of this I'm doing monuments for other artists and my work is not selling, you know, I try to sell in the galleries and the comments were often yeah, some people that people that gets it gets it and like right. it. But most people would not be attracted to buy it. I say that, and the comments would be that, oh well, that's uh, decomposing; it's falling apart. You know, mm -hmm. why is it missing an arm? Mm -hmm. It's morbid. It's, it's, and I say, gee, this is not what I want to express. It's the opposite, right. right? I'm not showing the bones because I'm thinking I'm dead and decay. I'm showing the bones because these gorgeous bones. You know, it's cool. <laughs> what the bones? They are sculptures by themselves. Right. You know, uh -huh. it's what intrigues me is how beautiful we are. And everything alive is, you know, the evolution of it is what is intriguing, how it came to be. I mean, you can you can easily say that God created it, but that answer is not very satisfying to me. You know, it's a quick answer, <laughs> but uh, it's much more interesting to see and feel how it evolved. Yeah, everything, you know, from nothing to right. what it is. That evolution is absolutely amazing yeah. to me. So anyhow, what I was talking about was life and life, how life takes over everywhere. You see a bone on the ground and and uh, life starts to take over. I mean, it starts to decompose, but it also exactly. starts to grow, you know. Mm -hmm. So that growth is what I was talking about in the human body, the amazing uh, life and miracle of life, how it takes over things and it's always everywhere, you know. Right. So, but uh, but it was not it was not selling, and obviously through the years, it's well, it sounds like your intention wasn't c communicating what you were, what you were intending to communicate wasn't communicating. Right? right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. and not selling. Of course, you want to make a living out of doing sure. art. You know, yeah. so I was doing monuments for other artists. And many times I would do a big piece, and I say, "Oh my God, how how is this sales?" <laughs> I just I don't <laughs> so, uh, but but so they, at some point they, I got a. a one of the founders said, "What well, you know, enter a competition for a horse fountain in Vegas. Ah. And I said, ah, okay, well, do some horses and did some little horses. A little bit on my style, kind of a loose style. Mm -hmm. And uh, okay, I didn't get the competition, but then some people seemed to like it. And I said, well, maybe if I do animals, since we're human, we relate to directly to to these to ourselves and we're smooth and then people like feeling the... That relate too closely to the, to the again the bonds that maybe I'm showing on the sculptures. So maybe if I do animals, they they won't get that that energy. And uh, so I said, oh, let's try it. And I did a cat and uh, uh, sent it to the galleries. You know, I have some galleries already, mm -hmm. and uh, and and then the galleries love it. You know, I started selling it. And I at first said, that's that's a shallow cat to me. That doesn't really mean too much. <laughs> But then, then I said, okay, well, if I'm going to do animals, why? What is it that I want to express with the animals? What is the part that attracts me? And you know, this, uh, as I said, I was working for a foundry shortly before that that does the 
the typical thing of the wildlife animals that are the lion is killing the bear and the bear or whatever they're all killing each other and that <laughs> sense of power right <laughs> and yeah. i'd say that's not that's, that's not what i want to do it doesn't interest me and then thinking about it I say well what what i really love the animals is their sense of purity their directness their innocence and so i try to focus on that on that that fact that direct fact simple right and direct and uh and then I start to put also the numbers and letters and the organic elements, and then it became deeper to me, more acceptable. To me, once you start uh, adding these other elements, it, it really take it out from being just an animal. And be also, you know, you're getting a little bit of the uh, humankind civilization influences mm -hmm. into, the, mm -hmm. into the piece and made it more acceptable, and I started to have fun with that. At the mm -hmm. same time, continue to do the human figure. But what is interesting, I guess, is the way it uh, it, it really took a, such a different road expression than the human figure. So the animals start to all of a sudden be about fun, and I I like the, the fact of making me smile and make you smile when you see him. So it's about that beauty and innocence and and about the they became about the richness of everything, you know. So at the end, I am putting all kind of elements on the animals. Therefore, as I said, making more uh, more universal in that sense, more interesting to me, and end up having a quite an interesting contrast between the two of them. The human figure, I never think in trying to do a human figure smiling, and why. I don't know, that might be some deeper reasons for that, but <laughs> as I said, it continues to interest me, the human figure as a very, uh, very universal, mysterious, uh, almost undefinable uh, yeah. Yeah. subject matter. To me, it's important for you to retain the human figure because it anchors your work in a certain area. It anchors a, 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 a an, um, maybe an authority in your work, a power in your work. Mm -hmm. um, and then at the other hand, at other spectrum, you have the animals, which people love. You know, they have these marvelous personalities. As I said, whimsical, joyful. You know, mm -hmm. people are entertained by them. But uh, I notice that you always <clears throat> come back to the, the human form because you're grounded in that. Such mm -hmm. an important part of your creative process. You know, your yeah. expression, and they are powerful, and moving. I, I think they're just amazing, really, really amazing works. So let's talk about the color, the patinas, because that's something that you've kind of changed the paradigm a lot in sculpture. I mean, I know there are other people that have used colored patinas, but I don't think anyone's had vision that you had about it. How did that evolve? I kind of connected it, I, as I remember the earliest things. I started putting some colors on the, that cat, that Italian. In fact, some galleries um, comment to me that don't put so much color when you keep the bronze as a classical, because, you know, especially at that time, is the 80s, uh, most bronzes, if you look at it, are are the typical classical bronze, mm -hmm. you know, bronze chemical, the three yeah. chemicals that are commonly used. And so it was a uh, resistance from the galleries to accept the color, mm -hmm. you know, and I remember kind of, I don't know, say, you know, uh, well, sorry, no, I want to put color. You know? <laughs> and it, I started to connect it to Colombia, to my Colombian roots, right. I guess, and the, and the markets of Colombia that are, that are that I remember the vivid colors of, uh, you know, the tropics, the, the colorful. And that that sense of warm palette uh, was very strong. It started to be more and more clear and wanted to, to make it, well, to play with the color and the sculptures more and more. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it was a process of, uh, of, of how to do that. And at that, at, don't, at some point there, it enters this, uh, this thing of the line with the scale from black to white, where the color is always changing on the scale, you know. Mm -hmm. So if you look at my patinas, it is always going from strong to soft, mm -hmm. from nothing to mm -hmm. to strong, too strong, and from a point of attachment to disappearing. That kind of concept is uh, is, is start to be more clear through the years, and uh, now it's very very much used mm -hmm. all the time, you know, mm -hmm. in the transition of colors being always very soft transition, mm -hmm. uh, even from one color to another or the same color changing in, in intensity. I noticed it in your uh, 
your owl, the white face of the owl. I forgot the name of the owl now. Uh, Samantha. Samantha. Samantha, yeah. Yeah, that was interesting, a breakthrough. I mean, all that white was like really dramatic and mm. bright and had a different different effect, a really, really strong effect yeah. using no color, basically just white, mm -hmm. you know? But um, I hope that people will take some time to tune into the a video that you produce called the process video. And to our audience, make sure you take some time to do that because Nano created a video of the process he goes through to create every single one of his sculptures. And it's just extraordinary to see the bar that he sets to create every one of his works of art. I mean, just amazing what you go through to bring this into existence. You know, yeah. uh, it's got to be one of the highest bars in, in any type of creation of art, you know, in the history of the world. I mean, maybe glass blowing might be, you know, similarly challenging, but bronze sculpture, that's it's pretty ma amazing. It's a magical it's, process. Yeah. It sure is, and it says a lot about your dedication to your work. You know, your willingness to go through that process for every single work of art that you create, and they're all done by you under your supervision with your team. Nothing is, uh, you know, created unless you 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 approve it and make sure you go through every single piece, go through the process. I know a lot of times you have to weld pieces together; they're cast independently, and then you have to bring them all together, weld them, tool the welds, and then and do the patina process just yeah. extraordinary the amount of work that you have to go yeah. through yeah it's so you work like this for example how many pieces would would this piece uh, well, this is actually a rather simple piece because of the straight figure but well not that simple i guess uh, no yeah this this comes apart uh, that comes apart the bone in the back this comes apart mm -hmm. the ball and then the piece gets cut here here mm. here so yeah, not that simple. It's like seven pieces there. Yes, seven, seven, <laughs> seven pieces is simple. Yes, and I know you just did a monumental version of this yeah. sculpture too, which is just jaw dropping. Yes, I just right. saw it for the first time. I was just like, oh my goodness, this is amazing, absolutely amazing. So I know that you like to work in large format too, based on your your past working in these mm -hmm. monumental sculptures. Yeah. That must be really exciting for you to do these life size figures. Yeah, yeah. It's, I, you know, in this big one in particular, I just did. I I I didn't do it for the market. I wasn't thinking in right. you know, and that that's the figurative is difficult to sell in the first place. And this big piece, uh maybe nobody gonna buy it. But thinking on a legacy, I, I, right. I said, you know what, I'm gonna invest money on yeah. making some of these pieces big because I, I do love them. I I, yes. I believe in them and and big they feel stronger too. Yeah. It's just beautiful. I love to see them in a, in a park in a city. Oh, uh, absolutely. And, and I, I do believe for some reason I I see these pieces next to places that has to do I mean in big cities next to places that has to do with human you know, the the UN I think it has to do better related to universal human mm -hmm. Things and uh, I, I've always seen kind of that vision, you know, that they deserve right. to be out there in some right, large right. city. Well, there's something that takes place with a large, you know, monumental scale that just, you know, the way we relate to large format things changes their whole perceptual experience, you know. Yeah. I don't know, maybe it's our size in relation to something that's gigantic or whatever, but it's really a powerful part of the aesthetic experience. Mm -hmm. But you also move effortlessly between monumental sculpture and tiny sculptures. Okay. You have the ability to just move all the way through the you know those different different uh, uh, scales and I think that's extraordinary too mm -hmm. you just have such fluency you know in whatever that you conceive and whatever you you create which is marvelous as well um, when you make a sculpture that you, you come up with an idea let's say Davian for example the dragon which you know you, you made the first Davian and then you made a smaller version then I think you made a uh, the reflections version and then now you have the large life-size version large, okay. um, Take us through that process. What 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 uh, is it like to reintroduce the work, to reinterpret the work again? That must be very fulfilling for you to be able to constantly find new ways of of expressing the same subject. Well, the, depending on the piece, uh, in the, in the case of Devian, is not a lot of changes. In mm -hmm. the case of pieces like this or other pieces, I have gone through more of a uh, changes. You know, mm -hmm. more complete. Uh, more complete change. Uh, in the case of Davian, uh, the piece is so so popular in a way that uh, that's a reason to do it in different sizes. Mm -hmm. you know? It's not so different, the little from the large. Mm -hmm. um, Pretty, so, it's pretty similar. But yeah. I know there's a lot of uh, sculptures that you do that were a lot of transformation, a lot of scales in them. Yeah. And when you come up with these stories and the narratives about the animals, is that something you have in your mind ahead of time or does it sort of appear to you while you're working on the sculpture or when you're finished with the sculpture or all of the above? Yes, all of the above because sometimes <laughs> you might see the story before I even did the drawing. You know? 
or start the drawing, I already know the name of the piece. Uh, <laughs> or sometimes I don't know the name of the piece six months later. You know, it's, uh, it's a dialogue with the piece sometimes right. and, and it evolves with you. But, uh-huh. So it, it, it happened in both ways. You know? right. It can be very defined from the beginning or very undefined. Right. And, Evolve. People love that aspect of your work. You know the fact that so many of them have stories that they can, they can uh, relate to. You yeah, know, to the story of the animal. Yeah, and the stories also happen kind of funny. You just I don't know, you know, but like this whimsical sense of them mm-hmm. brings up that story. Right, and, and it's fun. You know, just yeah. uh, that simplicity. I guess it connected to that original idea of right. the simplicity of, of uh-huh. the animal, the directness. Right, right. Any artists that you're looking at today that inspire you? In the contemporary art world, do you look at? Um, yeah, it is some uh, some uh, few sculptors that I love. Uh, Carbonell, you know, you know, he's uh, Carbonell. He's, I think he's in the United States. But he's a very strong anatomical figures. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, and there is another guy in Central America. Uh, that is known. It's, 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 it's around. In, I don't remember his name right now. I want to buy a piece of him. So it's just a few, two, Can three it, sculptors yeah. that I really like. What uh, about our uh, sculptors from the past? Well, Michelangelo, Michelangelo of course, Bernini, yeah. Uh, yeah. Giacometti. Bernini. Uh-huh. Giacometti. Those, yeah. Do you like Cesar? You looked at Cesar's work? Cesar? You know Cesar? Cesar. French sculptor, yeah. Very brilliant sculptor, yeah. Well, it sounds very familiar, yeah. but I don't yeah. picture it. Yeah. C-A-E-S-A-R, Cesar. Uh, interesting. I think you'd like to look at his work as well. Um, yeah, I think it's interesting to see, you know, what artists have implanted, you know, into your experience and have influenced you. And I can see certainly the importance on anatomy. I remember mm-hmm. you, uh, one time I saw one of your clay models of Leonardo the lion. I think you put it on, on Facebook, just, just the model without any of the elements. Mm-hmm. And I was so impressed because I, I, I realized this is a rigorous sculptor. This is a man who knows anatomy. He knows musculature. He knows, you know, the skeletal structure of the animal. He had the movement of the animal. He had the feeling like the, the, the muscles were tightening that were moving and they were relaxing that weren't, weren't moving. It was amazing. And, you know, the realization came to me that you are, you are a classical sculptor at heart. You know, you really are. You're, you, you have all the ability of any, any great classical sculptor, but you've just, Amplified it, taken it to another another level now with the you know the, the elements and the other almost surrealistic aspects of your work. I think surrealism plays a little bit into your art. Would you say? Yeah, 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 yeah. Bit. And I do feel that it's kind of classical work. Yeah, because for for a long time, actually, I had the problem, including now, that in the world of the galleries and art in the galleries. You know, it is what people call the commercial galleries, which all galleries are commercial. But the commercial galleries are normally the galleries that, well, most of the art is being sold, you know, the paintings and all that. And then the, the, um, the avant-garde, the uh, conceptual art today, you know, and obviously the conceptual art. So I, I always fall in between the two of them because this work was too uh, off to be like accepted in the regular commercial galleries mm-hmm. and not conceptual enough for the conceptual galleries. Mm-hmm, of course, yeah. So I think that will always play a, a role in not finding a, mm-hmm. a venue yeah. to, to sell them. Not finding the path, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. For the conceptual galleries probably had too much skill you know, too much craft and skill associated with it. <laughs> Conceptual, I know. It's, uh, it's obviously interesting. It's not my, I mean, I, I love to see different ways to express art, of course. Right. Uh, sometimes I find it, well, a little cold. And Yeah, yeah. Well, I've always found you to be very open. You have a really open sensibility about art. You know, we've talked about, you know, art for many years together on and off. And you, you're a person who really, you know, you're very non-judgmental. You're open, you know, to whatever influences around you, which I think is a beautiful quality that you have. I think it's another reason why your work is so wonderfully embraced. Um, how do you feel about the incredible success that you've had? I mean, when you look back at your career now, what you're probably... 60s, Six, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Six, six. So you've been a professional artist now, 40 years, something like that. Yeah, a long yeah. time. You know, you've been devoted to your work, committed to it, and now you've reached this point in your career where people can't wait. You know, to collect your work, they're willing to wait a year or sometimes longer than a year to receive a sculpture. 
pay for it in full and be completely happy to, to do that. <laughs> and not um, many people are in that position in the art yeah. world today. So you have any re reflections on your, your success? Well, you okay. I always, obviously think uh, it's, uh, it's very difficult to make it like that in art. Yeah. And yeah. Certainly. Yeah. Not, not easy. And, and yeah, you need some, some luck and uh, be in the right place at the right time, I guess. No, uh, obviously, luck. a lot of uh, so much luck perseverance. In, the world, you know? yeah. Yeah. in yeah. my case, I know perseverance. perseverance. Is, yeah. Yeah. I often say, I don't have talent, I have perseverance. Yeah, yeah. well, you have talent too. <laughs> you work, work <laughs> hard at it, you know, that's for sure. But I have, what I always say is mostly I had passion, and that's nothing replaced that. Because yeah. if you have passion, you don't. You don't need nobody to push you to do it, uh, right. and you don't care if it doesn't sell or not. Only you care a little, but right. you're still going to do it. Yeah. And so, passion is the most, yeah. the biggest gift. If I yeah. could think in anything, is that. Yeah. yeah. And of course, I feel uh, happy to be able to to do that, but I don't think too much on fame and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I can continue to enjoy your success. Continue to bask in it because you've earned it. You you really deserve it. And thank you so much for taking the time to thank talk you. with us. I think this is really great information. I know that people who love your work are going to really savor the opportunity to hear about the origins and some of your ideas and your and your passion, which is so important. So thank you, Nano. And okay. uh, we look forward yeah. to many more years of working together and bringing your art to just enthusiastic collectors all over the world. So be Thank well. Thank you. We'll talk again soon. All right. Thanks.